Hello, welcome to the April 12th, 2024 Club Cubase live stream. My name is Greg Undo and I'm the host today of the live stream. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can ask your questions in the live chat field or send questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. When asking questions, realize that my ability to answer questions in a real-time manner may soon be eclipsed depending on how many questions there are. So if you don't see an immediate response to your question, if we could avoid asking the same question over and over again, that would be appreciated. Um, we should have an index of all of the topics pinned to the top of the uh, chat field uh, or pinned to the top of the comments field. Uh, I have a function to go to with my son tonight. So the, uh, the index may be posted tomorrow morning. So just a quick heads up on that. And if you wanted to search, we've covered over 32,000 different topics. And if you wanted to search for topics, you could go to cubaseindex.com. And we want to thank you on from Stockholm for creating that website where you could just search and then it will immediately take you to one of the Club Cubase uh, live streams where you can see that topic uh, being answered. If you want to, we also have a PDF file of all of the topics that are covered and if you want access to that you could email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de and i think it's also on the cubase nation discord we want to thank uh, both uh, jazz dude and agent k for serving as moderators on the live stream they don't work for steinberg they're volunteers to make it a better community so we'll give special thanks to them and also give kudos to Jazz Dude for his work with the unofficial Cubase Nation Discord. So it's a wonderful resource of information for the Steinberg community. Once again, my name is Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America. I primarily focus on Steinberg products. I'm presenting from just outside of Washington, D.C. in the United States and Alexandria, Virginia. And if you're watching the live stream live or even afterwards, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. And with that, let's go ahead and look and start answering some questions. All right, so we see Suede TV and Recording Studio just says hi. We see Jazz Dude on. We have Jan from Cubase Index. We see Benny from Sweden. See Uno Memento checking in from Finland. John Costigan is saying hello to myself and the Cubase Planet from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Okay, Parabot2 asks, uh, Hi Greg, Cubase 13 Pro. I have a complete 32 MIDI controller. I see it in MIDI port setup. I see the blue light in the lower right hand corner when I push a key, but not getting any sound routing issue so yeah it, it could be so let's say if we have an instrument um, I'll just go ahead and load up a preset here on an instrument so we'll open up a retro log okay so what we want to do is when you go to add an instrument I should point this out as we we're doing it you could set the MIDI input port so you should probably see your complete control listed here. Most of the time it's going to be captured in under all MIDI inputs. So this way we don't have to specify a specific MIDI port. That anything that can be connected, we can see the MIDI. Make sure that if you have your complete control set up for to work as a MIDI remote, so if you've defined it as a MIDI remote, you may have a separate MIDI port for the remote functions, a separate MIDI port for playing the keys. So make sure that you have that set up correctly when you go to the setup of the particular device that you have the correct, um, the correct control ports right there. Also make sure that when we go to your studio menu to studio setup and you could see your MIDI port setup you could see if your particular device is listed in all MIDI input ports so at this point we could <clears throat> you want, if you choose in all if you choose in all MIDI inputs at that point you want to make sure that your complete control 
is set there. If it's not there, you could go to the MIDI inputs where it says all MIDI inputs here. Physically connect it to your core, to the, com the control controller. Uh, one other thing, if it's still not acting up, if it's still not behaving rather, if you go to preferences to MIDI, make sure that MIDI through active is checked. So I think between one of those different scenarios, you'll be able to get it sorted out. But if you're seeing the blue light here in the lower right hand corner, like when you hit a key, that's a good sign that it's communicating with the particular program. All right, we see spa dogs on. Okay, Carlo R asks, how to change the color of the work interface? So if it's kind of like the background colors, so if we want to change the colors of tracks, we can come over here and just change different colors. If we want to customize the appearance of like the grid lines, how the backgrounds look in a project window, the editor, we can go to your preferences, come here to under user interface, and we could just say, let's go to color schemes. So here, if I wanted to change my project or my e editor area background, at this point, what we could do, so say I want to change this. So now when we go to our project area background, if I want to make this brighter, I could just hit OK. <clears throat> Clear my throat. And then we could see the immediate change there if we go into like a midi editor if we wanted the editor background to be carried over so let's say if we come here and we go into our editor background if we wanted to change that again go to your preferences maybe under the edit menu on windows platform and again, to color schemes, we say editor area background, and we can make that brighter if you wanted to. So as soon as we come there, so again, just go to preferences. So if you want that to be very white, we could do that, or we could just load the defaults. So let me know if that's what you're wanting to change, Carla. Okay. All right, Tone Vision Ton Studio says, hey Greg, is there a shortcut to enable or disable the group edit function? I do lots of voiceovers slash podcast edits and this would help a lot. So let's take a look. So if you're not familiar with it, if we have tracks in folders that we could enable group editing. Let's see if we'll look in the key command. Okay, so maybe we'll just see if it's K. So we'll see if that does it. So group editing on selected tracks on and off. All right, so let's say if these are grouped. And so now let's say if I turn on K. So it looks like Yeah, so it looks like the letter K would would just turn that on and off. That looks like the default keyboard shortcut for that. So just the letter K. 
can see that turning off and on right there. All right, let's find our next question. <clears throat> All right, we have Capital Razor joining us. We have Detlef Randeroth checking in from Dusseldorf. Thanks for being here. Matthias Hamburg. Is, Matthias is joining from Hamburg. Hamburg. And looking forward to learn some new features. All right, wonderful to see Spa Dogs checking in from Oakville, Ontario. Dean Garvey Jazz from California. Glad you can make it in Tim Cave from the Netherlands. Uh, Ecstasy Tunes. Uh, hi, Greg. Is there a way to draw modulation slash expression for multiple MIDI tracks at the same time, like in Dorco? So I don't think that it's set up, but we'll give it a shot here. So let's, let me just add. of instrument tracks so I think that we could you know copy it pretty easily but let's come over here and see if maybe if we do I'm just gonna hit control or command G Let's see if I now draw in modulation on one. I don't think that's applied to the others. Let's see if I put these into group editing. It's just going to be applied. So I think that we could copy and paste, you know, select the controllers. So if I have um, all three of these controllers that we could select the controllers. So if we copy there. Just take group editing off here. All right. So we have kind of one event here. And let me just see if these are, let me ungroup these. So I think if we select all your CCs, copy, and Alt-V, Alt-V, that you could kind of paste those into the different parts, but I don't think it's automatically carried over. So, um, but I've, I've, I've asked for that myself as an option, but I haven't found it yet, so. All right, always wonderful to see Robbie Bowling from Dallas, Texas. All right, and we have Techie saying bonjour, Ramet, excellent. So I'm sure I mispronounced that. I never studied French, unfortunately. All right, great to see Randy Lee from Texas. We see David M. Attracted a couple of comments, all right. All right, we have a question. Trying to create chord pad patterns, dragging from track to player mode, drop down, rhythmic, rhythm captured, but harmonies on arpeggios are revoiced. Um, same with MIDI loops. What am I doing wrong? Okay. All 
Okay, so let's go ahead and just take a particular pattern. So I guess we're gonna drag it from, I'll take this project here. Just get this open. All right, so we're going to drag a particular MIDI pattern here. So let's say we'll take this. All right, so I'm going to drag this down as the basis for the pattern. And now as we will turn this on. Just all right, let me just try a different pattern here. Hang on, Let's see what that one is. Okay, so I'm going to drag this. Just try to send a new project that we have. Okay, so, all right, so now we have this and it's our original pattern here. Turned off the chords. So I drag that and now when we get a play, I'll turn this on, we'll record enable. So now when I trigger the So obviously, you know, depending upon like the contour, kind of the harmonic contour, if you're switching, you know, something that, you know, if you're adding sevenths to something and maybe it was just a straight uh, three voice chord that could change kind of the voicings, but that seems kind of... So I think that's kind of working as I would expect it to, but let me know if I'm doing something differently than you are. <clears throat> All right, we have John Barry checking in from a very sunny English Riviera. So thanks for joining us. And we have Andreas uh, Haydn checking in from Austria. All right, and we see Val checking in from Vienna. All right, Daniel Pashman says, uh, 
Hi, Greg. Any word on automatic bus routing when adding to a folder? I know there's a key command for it, but I would like to drop tracks in a folder and it automatically route to the folder slash bus. So I realize that, you know, when we're doing buses inside of Cubase, not, you know, it's more of an organization or when we're doing folders inside of Cubase, it's more for an organization thing. So you may drop a MIDI, <clears throat> you know, if you have different strings, if you want it, like everything to be, you know, and we could have nested folders. So if I wanted to come here and we have this project, like I have my drums in a folder and let's say I have my bass in its own folder. So we'll just say, okay, we'll I'll activate the project. So we'll put group channel with that and I want a group channel for my guitars. So we'll come over to here. So we'll add group channel to my guitars. But let's say I want um, these to be in their own folder. these to be in their own folder. All right now let's say I collapse my folders and I place these folders into a nested folder here. So if I drop a track into this if I drop a track into this folder, which group should it be bused to? So because we could have nested folders, you know, so again, and folders can contain tracks that don't pass audio at all. It could be marker tracks. It could be, you know, MIDI tracks that don't have audio going to external instruments. It could be a tempo track. It could be a chord track. So there isn't a mechanism to... And I think it's kind of could be a dangerous thing that if you drop it in that it automatically is routed. You can select a particular folder and you know hit a button and route it to a particular bus. You know, so you could do that with a logical editor preset, but I think kind of doing that automatically could be problematic if you have nested folders within nested folders within nested folders. So again, think of the folders as more of an organization that isn't tied to groups, that isn't being limited to working with groups. But you can drag it in, assign this, and say run a preset, especially if you're working with templates, run this to my drum bus, run it to my guitar bus, run it to my strings, brass. If you want to, there's ways of doing that with the project logical editor, but nothing that's changed in regards to it automatically being done. And I think that could be a bad assumption to make for more complex projects. Val is sending his best greets from Vienna. Glad you can make it today. Okay, we have Manu checking in from Honduras. Says, how do you customize the size of the faders in the mix console? So if you hit the G and H keys, we can just simply make them wider. So we could zoom in and out just like we do with our zooming in and out of content on our main project window so the same function will work here if we want to make them taller we can just simply extend that way so if we want to make them kind of tall and wide or if we want to make it short and narrow so we could extend visually vertically this way by just grabbing that line or hitting g and h to just simply zoom in and out to change the width. So let me know if that's helpful. All right, Val is cooking while learning and watching the stream. All right, good for you, multitasking. Okay, my 
my chat field just jumped. Okay, David M. asks, uh, Hi, Greg, how would you set up a session which includes a reference track? I sometimes use a reference track, but may not be taking advantage of the power of Cubase, Cubase 13 on PC. Thanks. All right, so what we could do for a reference track is I kind of have this set up already in, in a project. So let me open up that one from my dear friend Clay Ostwald. Okay, so one of the tricky things with working with reference files could be that they don't necessarily have, uh, we don't want any processing that we're doing on our master bus to be applied to them. So we could use the control room to do this. So let's say I have my project here. So let's say at this point I want to go, I think we have like a mix down track here. So let's say this is my reference track. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is we're gonna take this and I'm just going to EQ it differently. So I'll put nasty mid-range bump on that. So we're gonna make sure that in our control room that we go to our audio connections and we go to the control room and what we could do is just activate a, a Q mix. So let's say I'm going to, you could right click add a Q mix. I have all of mine added. I'm going to come over here and we'll just call this our reference. Okay. I'm gonna take our reference track, instead of sending it out to the main stereo output, I'm gonna send it to no bus. I'm going to go to this channel, go to the Q send. So this is our reference track and we'll enable the Q send. So we just click on the Q send tab right here and we want this to be at zero dB. So now if we have plugins that are on our processing chain here, like our frequency EQ or different limiters, this reference track is going to go out, not through this, but into our control room. So let's say as we play now. So this is now all we're hearing is our QMix channel. So let's say this is my Q mix and I want to go back to my mix in comparison. So again, our mix right here, that's going through the master processor and our master processing here. And now I could just go to my Q mix. And this way it's not going through so if I come here to my master and I put on, let's say a flanger. We hear this in my main mix because this is on my master. But we go to the Q mix, our reference mix. So our master mix here which has our added flanger, just like here it's different. And now our reference, and you can just kind of go back and forth and you can use keyboard shortcuts to navigate from your reference track to your mix track and compare that way. So that's how you could set up a reference track in just a matter of a few mouse clicks. All right, great to see Harry Olive on, saying hi to everyone. The artist known as Love, just saying hello, everyone. Thank you for everything, Greg, so you're welcome. And he wants everyone to hit the like button. So if you hit the like button, that enables us to continue to do these live streams. It seems like a pretty fair price. 
Okay, so we see John A. Walker says the virtual Numpties album is released. Right, always wonderful to see Razel from Denmark. Thanks for joining us today. All right, so we see Trancer 1 just says please in German. So unfortunately, I don't speak German. So I know <laughs> worked for a company, German company, for almost 32 years and don't speak German. I'm sorry. I wish I could study a little bit of Spanish in high school. All right, wonderful to see Robert Higgins back from Morro Bay, California. All right, so we see GGRK ask, is there a way to, to that we could change the UI to be like the old Cubase, like the Cubase 5 look? So, you know, realize that, you know, as, you know, the computers have evolved since, you know, Cubase 5 came out, what, 2006, 2005? So it's like, you know, pretty old at this point. Um, that obviously the features have changed. It's like 18 years, you know, like there weren't high DPI uh, systems at that point. You didn't have 4K monitors. So there's a, you know, if you want to kind of change like the color schemes to be back, like we showed earlier, you know, you could come back and a lot of people say, oh, it's, you know, if it's, if you feel it's too dark, you know, just come here, you could change you know the project editor so the screen so you can say okay if you want this to be very bright you know we could do stuff like that as well so if you want to kind of you know change the appearance of some stuff but like the mixer is not going to look like cubase 5 so there's a lot of stuff that's you know just evolved in the last 20 years with different user interface designs and concepts and computer capabilities so, and if you're coming from Cubase 5, I know it's different, but I think that, like, you know, and the one thing that I think that the Cubase, like, user interface designers do very well, and to me, a good test of it is, like, if I'm on a version, I go back, like, a version or two, and I don't like it, because, you know, the choices that they made are really kind of make sense and allow you to look at it for a very long time. So I find even when I go back to 12 that I can't read the mixer controls nearly as well. I can't access functions if I go back to, you know, before 10, there's a significant update there. Version 8 was also a significant update. So these things evolve over time. But I think, like, as we move forward, that I don't like looking as much as the previous version. So I think that's where the... The GUI design team does a great job, and it's kind of a good test for me. Okay, Robert Higgins asks, um, I have a vocal line re reciting poetry. I want to alter the voice so that it is monotone, no fluctuation in pitch, same note for every word. All right, so let's see. I think I have just some, like an interview that maybe we could use as a basis for this. See, I think you might be able to do this with very audio. Okay, so let's say I want to take, um, I'll come over here, let's edit the very audio. So let's say where we have kind of natural inflections. OK, 
give this a shot. Okay, so let's say we want. So Scott Dixon joining us now, and uh, this is I said. See, I interviewed him, Victor Lane for. All right, so let's say. I think that we could even set our MIDI input. So I'm just going to hit like the MIDI note that I want, hit the next arrow, I arrow to the next note and hit the MIDI note on my computer, key, on my controller keyboard. So now we can listen to this. So Scott Dixon joining us now. And uh, this is, uh, I said, uh, see, I interviewed him, Victor Lane for Sports Center just moments after you'd won the race in the championship. So you could, instead of having it, naturally fluctuate like that so scott dixon joining us now and uh this is i said see, i interview him so and again if we just redo so you could try something like that i think that may be able to get you what you want to be able to kind of tame uh the pitch to make it kind of more monophonic sounding so give that a shot within very audio Okay, <clears throat> so we see from Josh, can I trigger the chord pads in pattern mode via MIDI track? Okay, so we could record the chord the chord tone. So let's see if I saw the project open. Okay, so let's say I am here. Okay, so I'm going to set the chord track as my MIDI input. So let, let's see if I just place this track into record. So now I've just basically record, I triggered the notes of the chord pad. The chord pad was playing the pattern and that pattern is now recorded <clears throat> directly into the MIDI event. So as we look at this, we can see that we have all of the chords just as if we played it. So let me know. So while it's not coming from the chord track per se, um it you know we can trick we can basically record our performance of the chord track into the midi track so let me know if that's kind of what you want to accomplish in the end and if not just let me know josh Okay, so we see Dallas LaRue checking in from Las Vegas. Uh, so we see from Trancer1 says, what is the genre here? So, you know, it, I'm not sure if it's kind of generally what we do is just answer questions that people have on their Steinberg products. And sorry, it can't be in German. You know, Memento says, by hitting the like button, you make Greg happy. So makes you happy as well. So, all right. And transfer one is just saying hi from Hamburg, Germany. So haven't been to Hamburg in a number of years, but it's one of my favorite cities to go to.
All right, so we see Harry Olive asked, does anyone like to have AI to, I guess, demix audio tracks directly on Cubase audio track, perhaps into several other audio tracks? So, you know, we could do this with spectral layers. Um, so with spectral layers one, which you get with Cubase, uh, you could, you know, do that and extract the vocals. But if we have a whole file, um, we could also just take it and let me just see if I may have a project here real quick. All right, I'll just, oh, here we go. I think this is it. All right, let's see if this is the one I was thinking of. But, you know, if you want to take this, so say we have our full mix here. So now what we've done is I went into spectral layers and we could do an unmix and I just choose to unmix the song. So what I did here is I just did the vocals in this example. But when we go to unmix and we choose song, we could choose to do, you know, the guitar, bass, drums, piano, and other parts and now if we wanted to in this example I did the vocals so if we so now I could drag the vocal file over and have it automatically in our just have that vocal file just directly in as a separate track so we could just drag and drop right in so you know spectral layers is an amazing tool and i think it's probably the best algorithm for unmixing different parts so it's pretty scary what you do i often compare to taking the eggs out of a cake after it's been baked and putting them back in the shell All right, Carlo R asks, uh, is there a plugin to automate the whole track to high frequencies before the drop? So I think what a lot of people will do is just kind of use filters for that. So let's come over here. Let's just take this whole track. I'll take just, it's not the, So let's say if I want to take this and we'll take just kind of like a whole track. So, you know, often what is kind of used for that, that kind of build up will just be like a filter. So let's say I'll just import a quick audio track and this will be highly inappropriate for our. Not the typical genre, but let's see if we can. I'll just throw a random, like a rock track on. All 
All right, so let's say as we're working with this and we want to do, so if we wanted to just kind of come over here, let's put a filter, plug on. So if you want to just come over here. So you can do those types of effects with filters. So let me know if that's kind of what you're thinking of. And realize it's not genre appropriate material, but I think gets the idea across. Chatfield just jumped. Let me find my spot. All right, so we see Parabot 2 says, Anyone know if uh, should Heliotron be showing up in my media bay on Cubase 13 Pro. So I'm not sure. I think, you know, that there is an instrument uh, as part of Howlingin Sonic, like the full Howlingin Sonic or Howlingin. So if we get to our VST instruments, let's go to Howlingin 7, that there is a... Um, make sure I got the name correctly here. But Howliotron. So this will give you kind of like a classic Mellotron instrument. So now, and so this, I don't think this comes with Cubase, uh, but you know, if you, accidentally installed if you have it with uh like so it's not heliotron it's haliotron but you have that and if you wanted to look through different presets for this as well you can just kind of over here, so if you want it. Or if you want like the classic Halyontron, Meltron strings, you could just kind of come over. Or if you want it like the strawberry fields you can come over and just but it's uh, again I think if you were to get the Howlingin Sonic Content Collection or Howlingin, this comes with it, but you may not have it with just being a, just with a Cubase 13 license. But if you bought the additional content, you can. All right, so we have Perti Komenin checking in from Finland. We see Nick just popping in to press the like, and he has family visiting, so he can't stay. So thanks for hitting the like button. Hope to see you more on Tuesday.
All right, wonderful to see Peter from Montreal. Hope your weather is returned more back to normal. Let's see, Tim K says, I got many instruments, which are older than I am, but I'm okay if none of my digital gear is old enough to buy its own booze. Yeah. Yeah, I think my my first instrument could now have kids. So could have kids. Yeah, it's kinda of scary, but it still works. Now with Parabot, if you can't see the Haliotron in Media Bay. So again, it's doesn't come I don't believe it comes with Cubase, but if you had there's the Halions sonic content or if you get Halion, but let's say if we just go over to media bay so I'll just open it up let's go to the vst sound and sometimes you could install it without it necessarily so here's your different Halion. So, but yeah, you know, make sure that you have a license for it you may see that you have like a little if you don't have a license for Halion or the Halion Sonic content that's sold in addition that doesn't I don't think it comes with Cubase that's sold separately then you should see it Let's see Jeremy Stout just says thank you Greg for doing these live streams so you're welcome just glad they're helpful for people Okay, so we see Josh is about the chord pads. It says, no, sorry, in pattern mode, I can trigger the melody pad via keyboard or when I press the pad, but I can't trigger the pads via MIDI part from the instrument track. Yeah, so it's not going to be the instrument track that feeds the chord pads. So, you know, we can't necessarily, you know, take the output here to feed, to trigger the chord pads. But if you wanted to take you know a particular preset what you could do so let's say if we have um let's play so if we want to come over here let's go to uh, our pattern and let me just find a quick pattern so let's say so now as we would trigger find maybe a keyboard pattern something here I'll just change this to a different patch so we could demonstrate this sure that Okay, so I'm going to come over here. Let's try different. Okay, so I'm going to just take a particular 
phrase here. So I'm going to record this into, so if we wanted to trigger it from the pattern, so what we could do is go over here, so I'll just record. Okay, so now if I want to play Let's say I will just drop some chords in here. We'll make a chord track. Okay, so I'm going to remove this. So let's say I have some. Some notes here in my MIDI and I want this MIDI to follow that particular pattern that we had recorded. So we have this pattern. So what we could do now, I'll just kind of start this is if we go to the MIDI. So instead of taking the patterns here, if we want to originate so let's say we just have block chords. So what I could do now is go select this. We will go to a MIDI insert. And this is where we can go to like the Arpachi SX. So if I go to not the insert, but the MIDI insert. Now let's go to the Arpachi SX. And there's all sorts of great um, arpeggios within here, but we could just take a sequence and drop the MIDI part. So now we're gonna take the chords and the MIDI data that are on the particular event. And as we play now, So, you know, but you could now just take, and there's all sorts of great, you know, so if I want to take this and map. So if you want to take a part that's on a track and then run it through the arpeggiator instead of doing it through the chord pads, the chord pads will allow you to write that into a track. But if you have existing MIDI data, consider using the Arpachi SX and there's great presets in here. And you could also drag and drop presets. Uh, and But this way we could have just our block chords and when we want to turn these block chords into the events all we'd have to do is select it go to midi to freeze modifiers and now those this arpeggiator has been written into the event so let me know if that makes sense josh so this way you use the midi the midi plugin and the MIDI goes into that, whereas the chord pad is sending the MIDI out. Uh, Scott Whitlow asks, is there one place to go to get a bunch of common Cubase macros, things like applying reverse reverbs, etc.? So, you know, the Cubase Nation Discord is really good for that. Um, but you know, I would, I would say if you were doing like a reverse reverb, I would probably, you know, probably wouldn't be a macro that would do that. But check out the Cubase Nation Discord. And if if you're not on there, Jazz Dude, I'm sure will share a link. But I've shared all my macros and uh, project logical editor and logical editor setups. But let's say if we have, uh, for instance, 
I wanted to take these effects here. So let's say uh, we're just like I want to put a, a reverse reverb on that. I could select these particular events, go to audio. So this may not be like a macro, but if you want it something like this, we could just say, let's go to plugins. We will go to my plugin collection here to reverb. And I'll say, okay, I want a reverence. We'll do plate drum lander and let's reverse it. So now And if we wanted to switch the preset here, we could browse. So let's do something like a two second plate. And again, reverse that. So now it's automatically being updated here. So, and if we wanted to add uh, a tail on that, we could again just kind of come over here so even if we want to take the range selection of this particular snare we could just extend a range let me just take my snap off here so here i'll just remove all of them here real quick just to show you but you could just do that but so let's say i want to take this one let's go to our plug-in So you could do different stuff like that. So, but if you go to the Cubase Nation Discord, there's lots of macros, and I think I've shared just so you get an idea how many macros are probably on there. So different ones that I've made. And if you want to see a particular macro or learn how to make a macro for something, you know, just let us know as well. Be happy to show you how to make it. But check out the Cubase Nation Discord. my computer to wake up here all right so best Korean Jesus asks uh, is it possible to warp audio without affecting the track tempo so yeah you know if you wanted to let me see oh we could show um so let's say if i needed to clean up like a bass recording show just a hot mess example here in my heart all right so let's say i've listened to the bass here So a lot of times we could use audio warp or you know free warp just to kind of tighten up performances so let's say here i want to quantize the audio itself so i will come over here let's let me just hide one thing here all right so 
when I go to just pull up my quantize, so I have the base selected. Let's say I want my quantize to be set to 16th notes, uh, and then I could just have audio warp enabled. So if we look at kind of the placement of the notes, we see it's gonna base this upon the hit points. So when I quantize, it's not changing the, the tempo, but we could tighten it up to the grid with musical warp. So oh, my timing wasn't so hateful on this. So let's say now when I quantize, you may see that some of these events may shift a little bit here. So let's say, so just looking at the amplitude, so we could kind of use audio warp to quantize. And we can see that we could now tighten up some of those performances so that they're more on a grid but the tempo is you know really and you could also do kind of free warping so depending on if it's not like a quantizing value if you wanted to warp but just kind of clean up a particular performance so i'm going to just come over here to audio uh, and I'll just take my hit points under if I get a real-time processing I'll create warp markers from the hit points and now what I could do is just say uh, you know this note was a little early or late we could snap so if I have J turned on so snap now I could actually just kind of snap and that could kind of fall right into the grid position that we want. So this way we could tighten up performances using audio warp or free warp, but not changing the tempo. We could obviously change the tempo as well, but it's not necessary. And great to see you on Best Screen Jesus. Okay, Jazzy Lamel says, asks, hey Greg, can you explain on how to use or set up the vocal chain in Cubase 13? All right, so let's go ahead and take a look. Okay. So the vocal chain is, we can think of as a collection of plugins, because often what you need to do with vocals is kind of very subtle, small, little tweaks and details with vocals. So as we kind of come over here, let's say I want to take off my, let's see if I have any inserts or, so I have a compressor here. Let's remove our channel EQ. Okay, so let's say we want to take just this. It all began. And I'll take my sends off as well. The moment I laid eyes on him. Okay, so let's come over here and just open up as an insert our vocal chain. Okay, so let's say I had <clears throat> on different effects taking up <clears throat> different on, on different insert sends, I had this kind of taking up, you know, EQs, all sorts of different processing in different areas. But now I'm just going to take this vocal and where it was a mono track, I'm going to make it a stereo track. So we'll do that. So let's say I want to add a little bit of reverb. It all began. I'll come down. Let's go to my reverb. The moment I laid eyes on him. All right, and let's make it just like my head. maybe a lush pop. And the sky turned magic blue. Now it's added delay. And I was falling before I knew. All right, and let's make it a stereo delay. All at once, he kissed my face. The world was like a brand new place. Felt my fears. Now let's say I want to be like a dotted quarter note Don't delay. Make you feel good. Knowing that somebody loves you. Now I want more of 
do. Don't it make you feel good. All right, now let's come now over here. Let's add a bit of EQ. Let's put in some heart. some low end. So I want to cut the lows. Somebody wants to take you just the way so we want to get rid of the rumbles. Don't it make you feel good? And like at the beginning, we could hear a little bit of guitar. Like some of his tracks are bleeding through. So let's come over here and go to the gate. It all began. And let's go ahead and set our threshold down here. The moment I laid eyes on him, he touched my head. And let's say, okay, let's do a little pitch corrections. Why not? So we can say that we are going to be in and I was external MIDI scale. So this, I think we are in. Before I knew so we could do this. So let's say, okay, we'll do internal, All it was major, finger And let's come over here to make you feel maybe good. An ex let's go to some. That loves you. We'll look at a de-esser. So if we need Don't to do that. Make you feel good. All right, now we'll come over. Give you their heart. Somebody wants to take you just the way. Now you let's get to our EQ. Don't it make you feel good? Knowing that somebody loves you. And let's say we want maybe just a little bit of compression on it as well. And what there type of compression of do we want? Ground. Different EQs. So if I want to switch this to like to a Poltec EQ, I could come over here. By love that's real and true. So we have different EQ algorithms. And when you feel a little down there beside you. Then if I wanted to use like the black valve compressor. There's someone who will pick you up, smooth it out when things get rough, keep your heart from giving up. So one plug in, we could just kind of. make you feel good. Knowing that somebody loves you. Don't it make you feel good. Knowing that somebody wants to give you their heart so kind of all of those typical vocal processes that you'd have to jump around you know open this window close that window open this one open this one open this one try to get those to all work together we can consolidate all of those different functions into one single interface just so you get your work done fast and easy and very effective you know so like i know a lot of people are just coming over here and just say oh i just want to run on the warm tube vocal preset somebody wants to take you just the way you are don't it make you so without feel any processing you just kind of put this preset on knowing that somebody loves you somebody loves you So, you know, again, just simplifying, you know, sometimes, you know, adding, it's wonderful to have so many features in a DAW, but if you can't access them, they're not quick to use, you know, with this one particular plugin, it's like, you know, 18 plugins in one, and that's really the beauty of the vocal chain. All right. Okay, so we see Tim K just says, just trying to get through guitar take without too many mistakes. I'm gonna say, I love being able to endlessly rewrite without any magnetic medium issues. Yeah, so. I was always so conscious every time, you know, because I always remember like working in analog tape that, you know, sometimes being in a session, it sounded so wonderful. And then you play back the very first take and it sounded different than what was, what you heard from the console and a live take. And you realize that every time you do, it, it's going to get a little worse. So we don't have to worry about that with digital. 
All right, you see from Josh, nice comment. And thank you for that. It says, thank you, Greg. You do an amazing job. Thanks to share your knowledge with us. Happy to help. Okay, sorry, my chat field just jumped. Okay, so I think I'm close to where I was. All right, we see DJ Mixes says hi from Switzerland back again after my new remixes I produced with Cubase. Unfortunately, I usually watch the live streams afterwards. So as long as you hit the like button, you can watch them anytime you like. But we're glad you're able to make it live. And thanks for joining us this afternoon or this evening for you. Always wonderful to see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. Glad you can make it. I believe the virtual ice cream distribution will begin. All right, Tim K just says, I would love to have in the DAW a specific type of Leslie unit. I love the top speaker rotates on a vertical plane perpendicular to the audience. Uh, maybe it's in there already. Can this be done? So let's say if I want to do something, let's see if we could take this, maybe this Rhodes patch and kind of mimic that. Um. All right, let me just check the preset here and see if we can get this. All right, so I'll just load up maybe organ type of patch and we'll copy that data down All right, so I'm gonna make sure that we have the rotary off here. Okay. All right, and let me see if I could just get. Okay, so let's see, uh, see if we could do this kind of with our rotary effect. So let me come over and say, we'll just go to this, let's go to our inserts. And my bender modulation. All right, so I think that, so here we could adjust kind of. All right, let me just get this section here to repeat. So here you could adjust the level of the horn separately. So if you wanted the bass frequencies and you could adjust a crossover point as well. So 
So here you could have kind of different controls for the horn and the bass speaker uh, and kind of blend those two together. So if, let me know if that kind of makes sense. So you say perpendicular to the audience. Um, so if you're doing it more on a vertical plane, but I guess what you could do, you know, for that, you might have to, so if you want it to be, instead of going kind of horizontal, you want it to be more vertical. Um, I think you could do it if you did it in kind of like an Atmos. So, you know, if we did an Atmos and had the multi-panner on, you might be able to create that height and kind of go up like from low to high in height. So uh, I'm sorry if I misunderstood about the low and high frequencies with that. Um, but so it could be more like if you're doing more of an immersive sound that you could take the organ and pan it. So let's say if we add, we'll try it here real quick. I'll add a group. Let's add a group channel. And let's say if I wanted to make this and I don't have this configured Um, where you might be able to hear it, but or, or let, let's give it a shot here real quick. So I'm going to take this, let's get a project. And we'll go to our setup assistant. switch my project 48k okay and now let's listen to it binaurally so now I could take this particular organ track And so let's say as we're playing, but what we could do here is we could narrow kind of the scope of this. And then you could just adjust the height controls. So if you wanted to do stuff like that, um, you might have to do it more kind of in an immersive environment to get that effect as well to make it more authentic. All right. Okay, reading through comments. David M is happy that Mr. Teams is in the building. All right. All right, Third Order Audio asks, um, do you have any advice for how to deal with level bounces between a verse and a chorus? If I loop the chorus and set up a decent balance, I find that when I go to other sections, it's way off. So generally, if, if you're having kind of problems with, you know, between like verse and chorus, level consistency is, you know, figure out what, you know, if there's different instruments coming in so, you know, it could be like often the verse may be kind of smaller and then the chorus would come in. So I'll just revert this and get an idea. So say during the verse. So a lot of times it could be coming down not to necessarily a mix thing, but maybe an arrangement thing. And sometimes you, you know, an easy way to fix a mix is to make the arrangement better. But let's take just a listen to this example. We just hear like the chorus during the verse. You know, so ideally you could have like the rhythm section try to be like the same levels between the two. And then as you add different instruments. 
So the chorus, we often will add background vocals. So try to keep maybe like the drums, the bass, if you have like a piano part, guitars, you know, try to keep, you know, always depending on what the chorus says, you may be adding more instruments. But if we keep those the same, then you may have to apply compression to new instruments. So let's say we have the chorus coming up here. So here we're adding a lot of background vocals. say as we kind of end the chorus here and say like a second half of the chorus so we're kind of bringing those elements in they're not like so loud so the rhythm section again is going to be like the same volume the lead vocal is going to be the same volume but the other tracks are kind of set up to, you know, almost lift the vocal from the verse, but none of the actual source volumes are really changing. They're being very consistent. Give, give those little hints that something is coming, little harmonies here and there, little flourishes on the keyboard. So you have a feeling that the chorus is coming. And if you find yourself that you're making a chorus sound good and the verse sounds bad, you know, just put the verse and chorus into a loop until they transition naturally into each other. Don't just mix the chorus. Don't mix just the verse. Mix the verse and chorus and bridge. And make sure that those things are all going to make sense. But, you know, think of it maybe not as a mixing solution, but an arrangement solution. You know, if you wonder why you like a lot of Steely Dan songs, why their, their mixes are so well cherished is because their arrangements were so perfect that they often, you know, would mix themselves just because the arrangements were so meticulous. So there's a lot of mix problems that can be solved through arranging. But if you have a, an example, I'd be happy to take a listen to it if you want to share it to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Great. Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button. I see Parabot 2 says, no wonder I can't see it and thought it was part of Cubase. So it's uh it's just part of the um part of yeah, the Halion content or Halion seven, so All right, Scott Whitlow just asks a follow-up question for the macros. Is there a macros toolbar that I can have at the top of the UI? Thanks. So there isn't like a macro area here. If we go to the edit menu, you can see all the macros here. Uh, a lot of people, if you look at like composers rigs where they have the touch screen, you know, they can just come over here and like if they go to the MIDI remote, they could have their MIDI remote and have like all the buttons trigger macros right from here so you could see it there. I kind of like running it now. The key, if I go to the key commands that I can adjust the key commands and actually this is one feature I lobbied for and Steinberg was kind enough to do is to actually like as we're building macros just to come over here and run the macros here so this way we could kind of see it all in one nice consolidated window but there isn't like a button just to kind of access macros but what a lot of people do that want that is we'll set up a midi remote or like a stream deck and just fire off the macros and if you have a stream deck you could actually have the name of the macro on the button so you could see what exact macro and you have multiple banks of macros. So if you get really into macros, you could do that. But the only place to really visualize them is from the macros under the edit, which could be better um, or doing it in the key commands. But once you trigger them 
through the MIDI remote. So if you just come over here and say, okay, I want this button to trigger a macro, you go to key commands. And then all the macros that you've made will show up here. And then as you just open this up, you can see what, when you press a button, what particular macro that is triggering from the MIDI remote. And you get open up this if you have it assigned just go to the mapping assistant and then you can see what just press a button and see what a what macro particular button is executing for you all right suede tv and recording studio asks in Nuendo 13, the media section, I do not see all of my instruments, especially heaviosity native instruments. Can I manually add them? Um, so you you can. So, but you know, probably these are using VST presets, which is kind of a part of the VST specification. I don't think native instruments supports that. I think they have their own format, which is fair. But you know, what you could do as soon as you you know, there could be someone that has gone through and made VST presets of all of those. But if you, you know, open up the particular plugin. So let's say if we are here, we have uh, the plugin open. You may need to, once you have this set, is just come over. And if you go to the top, you could just say, say preset. And then it will show up directly in in the list of presets here in the media so but you'll need to just and i don't think that there's a batch process of doing it it would be nice if companies like native instruments would support all the vst parts of the specification so that would make it easier but that's why you don't see it is because probably the company hasn't made vst presets so you could reach out to them, see if they have plans to do that, but you could manually do it, but it may not be the funnest thing. Okay, uh, Tha Reaper asks, for external MIDI instruments, where can you find MSB, LSB? So we'll come over here to a MIDI track. Okay, so, so here is where you can kind of see um, different, like your patch banks, but if we go into, so this is where you can see your bank and program changes, but if we go into, if we have an event, let's go to MIDI, to the list editor, Then we could say, let's import, uh, let's say, So here you get import the MSB and let's put controller change here. So we'll put it the same. And if we wanted this to do is it 32, yeah. So you can put in your, you could just enter them in directly here in the list editor is where a lot of people will enter those in. So let me know if that makes sense for you. All right, Tim K asks, uh, newbie question, <clears throat> I'm musical but also visual and might need things to unstack and spread out. Anyone else find using multiple screens helpful? How about touch screens? So I think that multiple screens are very useful. I have a friend in Nashville. I think he has like nine different screens, and, and it looks pretty cool. Um, so it's useful. I don't find 
I find that most people tend not to use the touch screens after the ergonomics, you know, like I remember a friend of mine got a popular uh, touch screen controller and he's like, yeah, after I mixed for a day, my arm was sore and, you know, it was like, I was only really using one arm and ergonomics of it seemed really cool, but it wasn't. So, you know, I would maybe err on the side of more screens versus touch screens. So, um, but yeah, lots of people use touch screens or lots of people use multiple screens. So most composers I know may have one screen for video, one for a key editor, uh, and one for the mixer and one for project window. So for like many composers, that's the typical workflow. A lot of people have one for project window, one for mixer as well. All right, Ray AR asks, uh, what do you think about some AIs like Suno, and do you think Cubase 14 will include something similar? So I'm not familiar with Suno. I could look it up after the live stream. Um, but, you know, we're already seeing, like, AI functionality, obviously, with the spectral layers. The spectral layers, one that comes within Cubase that's doing AI technology for extracting the voice. We've seen AI kind of routines being used in some of the new Nuendo tools like the voice separator and tonal match is using AI. So if it's kind of a, you know, take my vocal, make me sound like a, you know, 18 year old girl kind of AI, I, I wouldn't anticipate that, but we'll have to see what comes in Cubase 14. We never know. So. All right, Scott Whitlow asks a similar question to Ray AR. Is there a mixing plugin to balance a mix other than isotopes, of course, looking for something to better visualize guitars, bass, drums, vocals? So, um, so you know, I wouldn't, I would, I would work, you know, I would really work on just trying to make my craft better. So I wouldn't necessarily rely on AI tools. I think, you know, it will, I think it, there's a propensity of it all sounding very similar and that could be good. That could be bad, but I think if you want something unique and fresh that that would probably be done by human. I see a lot of people kind of relying on tools and then, you know, wondering why their mix doesn't stand out and they're using the same presets, the same workflows. So I think it's always good you know, just kind of like any task, <clears throat> you know, like when you picked up a guitar, you probably didn't play Eruption by Van Halen on your first day, you know, just work on your skills and build your skills. And I think that will give you the better results in the long term. So. All right, DJ Mixes asks, Hi, Greg, normally I can undo a change with Control and Z. This does not work with volume. Do you have a tip, volume via the track? Okay, so if we are in a track and we move the fader, this actually goes to a different mix console, a different undo history. So if I move events around, I could come here and I hit Control Z or command Z that will undo the edits. But if I move faders, so let's say I move this fader here, I move this fader that I could hit alt or option plus Z and that would redo and we could just come right over here and see our particular fader movement. So if I come here, move this, let's adjust the panning, let's adjust the EQ. So now, we see my EQ, my panning, my fader, when I just undo, so it's a separate undo history for mixer movements as it is for edits. So it's alt or option plus Z to undo, alt or option plus shift plus Z to redo.
All right, Hassan Raza asks, how do I use auto-tuner target MIDI notes in Cubase? Please, if anyone can help. So if you want to take, um, if you want it to play notes via MIDI. So let's say if we come to this track, I will put on a, if we go to pitch shift, let's go to the pitch correct plugin and we'll say external MIDI note. I'm going to add a track. So let's add a MIDI track and I want this MIDI output to go to the pitch correct plugin that we just added. So let's say as we're playing now. Touch my hand. That we can now just send MIDI to this particular track. And then we could use that MIDI as the basis for pitch shifting. So give that a try. So again, just put the pitch correct on, add a MIDI track, route that MIDI track directly to... The output, so let's come over here. Make sure I have this, yeah. And then you could just use that as a basis for the pitch correction. All right, so we see from Josh, it says freeze modifiers. Thanks, Greg. All right. All right, so Tim K says, as a follow-up uh, to the multiple screen, uh, touch screen question, what about IC Pro app paired with a tablet or smartphone as controller, desk interface, units helpful? Not for everyone, but yeah, definitely like the QA's IC Pro. Um, and what I like about it is just having it on my phone. So if I'm recording in a different part of my house that's away from the Cubase, away from my Cubase setup, I could be in a different room and just with my phone, rewind, fast forward, I could see the screen and be able to drive the transport and be able to record directly there just using my phone. So I think, you know, especially if you're kind of working by yourself, that it's a great solution for that. So you got yours, I'm wondering if anyone is having, is running uh, Cubase 13 Pro on Windows 11 with JBridge to run older 32-bit plugins. All right. Ring through. All right, you see, best screen Jesus says perfect. That's exactly what I needed. Thank you. Welcome. Great to have you on the live stream as always. I believe he's in st from San Diego. All right, uh, Christian Toma asks, how do I make more channels if I want to record my song in three or four parts? Okay, so, you know, if we, let's say we have all these channels, you know, really all you would have to do is, you know, right click. And if I wanted to add more audio tracks, we could come here. So let's add 24 more tracks of audio. Uh, it's so much easier than syncing up tape machines that now you could just have more and more tracks going on simultaneously. If you want to add more MIDI tracks, more instrument tracks, more groups, more effects. So you could run lots and lots of tracks, even on a modest computer. All right, Graham Witcher, wonderful to see him on from Royal Wooten Bassett in England. Just wishing that everyone is safe and well and making great music. Such a good sentiment. And we see 
Michael Teams has granted Graham one gallon of strawberry cordial ice cream. Somebody Chatfield just jumped. All right. All right, so we have uh, from Best Screen Jesus asks, is it possible to change the speed of sound sliced in the sampler to speed up or slow down the chops? Okay, so let's take a look at it. So I think once it does slices, it may kind of put it into like you know, a mode where it's going to play back at the same tempo, but it's just, you open up a project here. Okay, so let me just, let's say we have Okay, so we have this loop here and All right, so let's say if we do slices now I think once it's sliced, it's automatically going to take it out of audio warp mode. All right, so I'm going to take this. I'm going to drag, so we get a slice mode here. Okay, and all right, so let's say if we get a playback here. Let me see if I could do anything maybe with the pitch modulation. This may not speed it up, but it may. Just thinking of a way to speed it up and change the pitch at the same time. So let's see if we come here. So if we wanted to kind of speed it up. So let's say if I split this and we take this MIDI event and put it into sizing applies time stretch that we could do this. And then we may be able to
So, you know, once it's been sliced, I'm trying to think of a, if there's a clever way of kind of, like, I know we could see if there's maybe something in. Maybe in loop mash that might be able to do it. So once it's sliced, it's kind of the rhythmic value is set. Um, so if you want to speed up and change the pitch, I mean, initially, if it wasn't sliced audio, so let's say if I get rid of this and we go back to our sampler control, that. I'll take the slice off and then so as we go to playback and audio warp is off and let me set my pitch bend range here to 12 So if it's not sliced, you could and just apply pitch bend. So let me know, best screen Jesus, if you need it to be sliced or if it's um, and then if you wanted to just kind of put this on loop as well, you could. You know, just say, okay, let's do just continuous loop and then if you wanted to be even farther, we could set, I think, two octave range. using your pitch bend wheel so let me know if that makes sense if that would work for your workflow or if you need it sliced for a particular reason um, but I think you might be able to get exactly what you want with pitch bend and make sure that audio warp isn't turned on Okay, we see Perti Komenin is thankful for the ice cream granted by Michael Teams. All right, Michael Teams has granted my family and myself one gallon of German chocolate cake ice cream. Sounds lovely. All right, Dean Garvey Jazz asks, in Cubase Pro 13, when I create a groove agent pattern, MIDI track, and a groove agent instrument, uh, bass, snare, cymbal, MIDI track, how can I create separate audio tracks for the pattern and instrument? Okay, so let me just come over, we'll just do new project here quickly. So do Groove Agent SE. Okay, so let's say we'll do like a rock kit. So I have my pattern here. Okay, so I'm gonna drag this pattern to my project window. Okay. So what we want to do, I'm just going to 
make sure I'm reading this correctly. Okay, so, so create a Groove Agent MIDI track and Groove Agent instrument based snare MIDI track. How can I create separate audio tracks? So, all right, so I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna route these outputs, these tracks to different outs here. So I'll say, we'll say, okay, let's go to output two. I want this to be, my snare to be output three. Output four. So as we do this, we can see that my buses are just gonna be, and let's go to my crashes and let's make this output five. So now that they're separated, I'm going to select this. Let's go to your edit menu. And we will go to render in place. We'll go to our render settings. I'm going to choose complete or the channel settings and hit render. And now each of those files has been rendered automatically to individual tracks. Now, if you're doing this with a, so that's how you could so once you just need to kind of bus it out and if we have an acoustic agent so that's a kind of a beat agent kit but if we want to go to an acoustic agent so let's say i want to come here to let's say to the kit Um, to do the routing in this is we would go to the mixer and choose, and we have 32 stereo outputs to choose from. And then once we have those 32 outs, we can, you know, once it's the busing is set up, just do a render in place. And now we could just have like our snares isolated, kick isolated. hi-hat symbols etc so let me know if that's helpful for you dean jazzy lomel asks uh hey greg can you go over the verve and how it works and if it's included so it is included with uh, version 12 and higher so verve is kind of a, like a really interesting it's a, kind of a great production tool because what you could do with Verve is, you know, where you kind of want something to kind of fill out the sound. Um, I think I have a project I could show you with it. You know, like sometimes you need um, particular instruments that kind of fill in little holes so, and I think Verve is a great instrument for that. Let's see, this is. Let's see what this is. Uh, All right, sorry about that. So let's say we have like, you know, guitar, bass, vocals. So if we listen to, this is kind of like those nice production shots here. So I'm gonna just remove verb now that it's in. 
so it kind of sounds more like a demo. With it out. And we bring it back in. It's going to kind of fill in those little holes. Right, so when we want to look at verb, it's like really simple because it kind of is a felt piano. So we have, uh, but we have different textures that it's layered with. So we can have just kind of like our piano. So it's not intended to be like a concert grand piano that you would use for like, you know, a list piece. You know, it's kind of... And when we do this, so we could have the piano, so we could adjust like the distance, color, and, but what's really cool about it is we could go to this texture. So we could say, okay, I just wanted to come over here and bring in, so let's go ahead and just bring in different pads, so. And you could use it just for these particular pad sounds. And now if I layer that with the felt piano. So what you're able to do is just kind of blend these two. And if you wanted to just say, and we could bring in the voice by the modulation wheel. So, and we could set that modulation wheel mount. So, you know, if we want to just. Then you have different effects so if you say okay i wanted to really just come over here and i wanted reverb or if i wanted to add a delay so i want the delay to be let's set it to you know a dotted quarter note delay so you've been just coming over here So again, we'll come to the texture here and say, okay, let's just try a different mysterious. So these are things that give you like really kind of sophisticated sounds, but really easy to access. So if you want to come over here, adjust the piano sounds, the layered sound, blend it to add effects. And again, that comes with 12 it's just a beautiful tool for you know making your mixes where you know sometimes there's those little holes and you want to kind of fill them in with something that's not intrusive verve is a perfect tool for that so beautiful instrument All right, so we see Tim K says, yes, I was thinking maybe we could do the spatial effects in Atmos, and yes, you're a genius, and the rotary control is highly in Sonic. I hadn't found that yet. Totally awesome. Thank you, Gary. So you're welcome. Okay. Always wonderful to see Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo. All right. Glad you can make it this afternoon. I guess, it, I guess it's afternoon by six minutes for you now. All right. Uh, we have from Achilles. Can I use on control room same outputs of my sound card to feed two different pair of speakers? So what the, you know, you're going to probably require two different outputs so if you're using if you have just a stereo out 
what the control room is going to allow you to do is to say, okay, we're going to come over here to our control room. We'll go to our audio connections. And we go to our control room setup. We can add speakers. So I'm going to come over here. We could add monitors. We have up to four monitors. Let's say I want to add a stereo monitor here. So if you wanted these to be able to switch back and forth, you'd want an audio interface that's going to have four outputs. So if it's just the same output itself, control room is just going to send it out of that stereo output. So you wouldn't really, you know, have a way of saying if it's, you know, one stereo output going to two different sets of speakers. Uh, the control room wouldn't control that once it's leaving Cubase, but if you have outputs one and two going to speakers A, outputs three and four of your interface going to speakers B, then you could just simply switch back and forth between your A and B speakers right there. But if it's just one single stereo output, then the control room isn't going to be able to switch and you'd have to have like a piece of hardware to do that which would probably color your signal as well All right, so we see from uh, Dean Garvey, Jazz uh, says, I would like the audio, it's about the Groove Agent uh, busing out, creating audio tracks. Says, I would like the audio created by the pattern MIDI to be on separate track from the audio created by the instrument MIDI track, not audio for each. So if you want it, if it's, if we're going back to just um, having, like if we wanted, not the audio. So let's say if we go here and I'll unmute this. So let's say we have this pattern. It has a number of different tracks. So we saw how we could bust it out to separate outputs. But if we come over here also and let's say on our MIDI pattern, let's say we're just looking at our velocity only. We'll look at this in our drum editor. So let's say I wanted to take each of these sounds and put them onto their own separate track. I could select the event, go to my MIDI menu, and we'll see dissolve part. I'm going to activate this project first. So once again, MIDI menu to dissolve part. And here we could separate the pitches from this one part and process that. And now each, I could have just a kick, the snare, hi-hats, etc. symbols so that each sound is now on its own separate track and on its own separate output. And then you could render and place those if you wanted to as well. All right, so my chat field just jumped on me. just find my spot okay okay so we have a uh, bud maynard checking in from san francisco thanks for joining us today All right, so I see just a question, please. Why and how do you have your pan settings like that? So usually when I get this question, um, like if I go to my mix console and if the panners seem weird, it's because if I have like an audio track that's routed out to like a 5.1 output. So let me just come here. I'm going to create just... So let me know if this is, if we get to my audio connections, I'll set an output and I'm going to add a 5.1 bus. And let's say this track 
is now being sent to the 5.1 output. So if you notice that all the other panners have changed, that's because we've introduced a, uh, a multi-channel output into the mixer. So let me know if that's what you're referring to. All right, Suede TV and Recording Studio asks, please, when and why would you use absolute mode in Nuendo 13? All right, so let's say I have all of these tracks here. All right, so let me just... Okay, so I have a number of tracks. All right, but I, instead of all of these being at different values I want these to all be at the same value so I could come over here let's put on absolute mode and now when I move one fader the rest of the faders will immediately jump and I activate Q link that would help and when I move one fader all the values will change to where this one fader is now this is also good if we have Let's say all these tracks are going, let's say to a reverb send. Okay, so let's say I want all of these tracks, um, or let's say feeding a group. Okay, so let's say I'm going to add a group channel here. And I want all of these tracks to feed, to feed a particular group. So I'm going to select all these tracks here. And I'm going to send all these tracks to a group. Okay, and let's say they're currently going different levels, and I want to set up like a parallel bus, but I so I want all the levels from these tracks to be going the same amount to the group. Like I want these all to be at zero dB, so no gain or cut going to the group. So I could put these on Q Link and go to absolute and I'll just come here to this value. I'll type in zero. And when I do that, all of the tracks will immediate, all the sends to that group will immediately go to zero. So we could kind of start off and not worry about other tracks that are feeding at different levels. So those are some different examples of why you would use absolute in conjunction with the Q link. So just to be able to kind of set those particular values and you know, if we wanted these to retain their proportionality, we could do that. So if I select these and I do a quick link, they'll keep their proportional value. But I may say, oh, I want these all to be right here. You could just use the absolute mode for that. So just a couple of scenarios for that. Let me know if that makes sense. Or if I'm talking about the wrong absolute mode. All right, Everett Neal asks, um, how are you able to make your audio track keep pace with the instrument track as you adjust the tempo after they've already been recorded? If I speed it up or slow it down, the vocals don't fit. Okay, so what you need to do, and we'll just kind of show you this, you know, is to make sure that you have your audio tracks in musical mode. So when you record a file, if you record an audio file, it's going to automatically be tempo stamped for you. So when I come over here, let's say I record a quick file. I'll add an audio track here. Call it tempo stamp. 
Okay, so we will come and hit record. So my tempo is at 100 beats a minute. So I record. Let's look at our pool window. So control P, we'll see my file. Enable tempo stamp is now automatically set at 100 beats per minute. And what we want to do is we could enable musical mode right from there, or we could just simply select the file and we'll see musical mode right there. So once the audio files have been placed into musical mode, and I'll just revert this because I probably have destroyed it. So again, I'm gonna take my audio files. I'm gonna select all of the files here. Make sure that they're in musical mode. And now when I change tempos, whether it's audio or MIDI, the audio will speed up. So I go to 88 beats a minute. My audio is going to slow down. So at that point, it's going to automatically follow. So probably your MIDI by default will be set to musical mode, but you probably just need to select your audio events. And again, you could select them all. And at this point, just put them into musical mode. then it should, when you change the tempo, your MIDI and audio should line up. Always wonderful to see Sable Winters, who's like number 87 at about 20 minutes ago. Great to see you on. Let's see Graham Witcher says that he loves Sable's latest track, Bathe Me in Love. All right, so we see from Tim K, just says very grateful for the help and for the community here. Every club Cubase session provides me uh, something useful. I got a lot of learning to go, but I could tell I'm in the right place. So it's great and glad that you're finding, finding them helpful. And thank you for the kind words. It's very humbling to read. So. All right, so, and we see from Graham Witcher, it just says, Verve really is just sublime. I've used it on lots of recordings, the best felt piano out there, and free with Cubase. Let's see, Keith Young says, excellent Verve lesson. Thank you. That's a, it's a fun project. All right, so we see question, uh, Spectralayers Pro 9, jazz ensemble with vocals. Please demonstrate the technique for precision separation of a mixed down wave file. My temps retain audio bleeds and artifacts. Thanks. So one of the great things that you could do, um, and I kind of have this, is let's go ahead and take a look. And I got this with a question that was mailed in. We'll kind of show kind of the same technique if you need to de-bleed stuff as well. Um, so if you have multi-track, so, you know, sometimes when you're, if you're separating out the band, so we could have different layers, but let me just find, okay, here we go. So obviously with spectral layers, we could take a mix and, uh, you know, un like a two-track mix and unmix it. And, you know, depending on the material, it, you know, some things will extract better than others. So, but let's say we have, like, we have our kick, snare, and drum, and hi-hat here. So let's say we're listening to this, and I listen to my hi-hat track. And we could hear, like, tracks, my kick and snare bleeding in there. Let's go to my kick track. I can hear the toms. So we hear the kick kind of louder, but we have live mics and multiple sources. We can hear the snare. So what I'm going to do is just quickly open these up as spectral layers. 
extensions. All right, so I'm gonna do it for each of these tracks. We'll run it in spectral layers. And we had a question that was about like uh, doing this with like a pod, a podcast where two different people were talking and one was, you know, and you're hearing the bleed of the other person in the microphone and how to isolate that. So I'm gonna take my hi-hat track. So let's listen to the hi-hat track and I wanna take out the kick and snare and reduce it in the hi-hat track. So what I'm going to do now is just come here, we're going to double click, we're going to launch our hi-hat track in the sample editor. And what we're going to do is use another track as the basis for de-bleeding. So we're going to go to our uh, process and we will go to de-bleed. I'm going to select my kick and my snare track. And you could adjust the sensitivity here and just say apply. So now when it's done, we listen to our snare track or the hi-hat track. And uh, so versus. So at that point we could use other tracks and it could kind of look at the analysis of those other tracks that are selected and take out the de-bleeding and take out those elements based on other tracks. So you could try to, again, just come into your spectral layer. So if you wanted to take out someone's voice that's bleeding through from another source, again, just as we go to your spectral layers here, we would just select your spectral layers event and then under process you'll see the de bleed and then you could choose your different sources and realize that every version is also in improving the quality so version 10 was a pretty significant step up from version 9 so you know check out the trial version of version 10 as well because there's some really nice enhancements with separation in version 10. See Michael Teams just says a revelation of the day right there. Verve piano, very nice. All right, my chat field just jumped. All right, so we see Dean Garvey Jazz just says, thank you, so you're welcome. All right, Everett Neal asks, how am I able to use my instruments from my Yamaha Modi X8 and Nord Stage 3 keyboard through Cubase? You know, so realize that when you do this, you're working with external MIDI devices. So, you know, the old school way of working with external MIDI devices is you would add a MIDI track and the MIDI track we would choose to, if you have them connected by a MIDI interface, you could choose the correct MIDI interface port and MIDI channel. Um, or if you're connected by USB, which is more typical, you could then choose your different USB device here. So now when we add a MIDI track, let's say it's set to the right port, it's set to the correct MIDI channel, you'd hit add track, then you could play in and it's going to record MIDI data. The MIDI data is not audio. So, you know, if you want to record it as MIDI, some people may just record it as audio. Like if you're a great player, you don't need to do any touch-ups, you're confident of the sounds, that you could just take the audio outputs and record it that way. When we work with MIDI, we can see that we're going to have all of your MIDI here. Now, MIDI isn't going to record the sound. It's just recording that this note was pressed at this time. It had a velocity of this much, and it lasted this long. So that will all be 
played back. So once we have the output routing, the MIDI information is going to go out through your MIDI interface to your keyboard, and the keyboard is going to generate the sounds. This is why you often hear keyboards or sound modules referred to as tone generators. So the MIDI is being sent out to that device. Now, what a lot of people do with keyboards is they have a mixer and they will take the output of their audio interface and the and combine it with the output of their MIDI keyboards. Some people may record the MIDI information, may just, once the MIDI, it's really easy to edit MIDI, like if you had a flub note, say, oh, I just accidentally dragged my finger there, you know, you say, I'm just gonna grab the eraser tool and just erase that note, super easy in MIDI not at, not as easy in audio so there's a lot more midi editing flexibility so if you could now have like a mixer with the audio interface output going into the mixer and the outputs from your keyboards going into the same mixer now what some people do is have a mixer like the mackie mixers were really good for this is they had what they called the alt three four bus so you could hit a button that would take the the sound of the keyboard and route it to outputs three and four that you could have connected into your audio interface so once you have that down you could do the audio routing and from the mixer or from the device and record it as audio into cubase if your audio interface has enough inputs so let's say you have like uh, an eight in eight out interface for audio. What you could do is go to your studio connections and then you could define these as external instruments where at this point we would just say, okay, my montage is connected. My montage is connected into inputs three and four, let's say of my audio interface. And now I could just go to load an instrument track and we would choose the external instruments so say okay now I'm going to my montage and now basically the audio output from the keyboard is being sent to an input in Cubase so this would allow us to run it through different VST effects so you know because you know and generally you know if you have two different keyboards they may have audio interfaces on them, but generally you don't want to use them as audio interfaces, just as MIDI interfaces. But, you know, kind of the age old dilemma why you see guys that used to have tons of O2R consoles, composers in a day when they worked with external MIDI was because they needed to combine the outputs of all their MIDI devices. Um, now, most people tend to use VST instruments for that. There's obviously a place for hardware instruments for live gigging and people love the sounds that they get, but realize that the implementation into a digital audio workstation isn't as convenient as working with like a VST instrument. Uh, so there's lots of great advantages to working entirely in a box, but you know, obviously just set up a MIDI track, set up the right port, and all the MIDI data will come in and play back how you deal with the audio if you're using a mixer, that's great. Or if you need to take the audio outputs from the instrument and re-record them as audio into Cubase, you could do that as well, either by just connecting it and recording the audio once you've done all the MIDI edits if you want to or need to, or using an external instrument. But I still have, looking at my rack, I think about 23 different external tone modules. I don't really use them much, but I have them that I had before VST instruments. All right, reading through comments. All right, so we have Mohammed Salah just saying hello to me and to everyone here. Glad you can make it. All 
All right, so we see why is tempo detection so inaccurate, or is it just me who doesn't know how to use it properly, even when analyzing a simple 120 beats per minute click track, its results are absurd. So sometimes it's actually like a bit hyper accurate, but let's go ahead and take a look. So we'll just do a new project here and I'll put a sample on the grid. So it's just Okay, I'll go ahead and just bounce. So it looks like that wasn't so absurd to me. So let's see, it all showed up as 120 beats per minute. So just, you know, so realize that while there may be a lot of tracks that are played to 120 beats per minute, you know, the internal fluctuations of beat to beat, you know, can cause those variations. But there, you know, we just put something right on a grid every single value here is 120 beats a minute so looks like that worked but realize that while a lot of people think of tempo detection by bar this is doing it at the beat level so you know and it could be that if you're swinging that beat two might be a little early or late beat three might be a little early or late beat four same thing that those could cause fluctuations in the tempo detection John Costigan wants to make sure that everyone has has the time to hit the like button. Okay. All right, uh, Byron K says, uh, can Groove Agent be programmed to play a whole song with intro, main fill, main outro is standalone without opening Cubase Pro 13? So if you have the standalone, um, so if you have just Groove Agent 5 by itself, um, so it's good, just take a quick, I think you do it with regular Groove Agent. Let me just check to see. Okay, so we can see that we have, you know, like our different, so we go to our pattern pad that we can,
Okay, so there is like what's called a jam mode. So you might have to have like a keyboard that will, um, something that can actually come, you know, like maybe fire off a MIDI device and a lot of foot controllers could be used for this. So when we do this, we could actually see, um, and let me see if I could get it to output so we can hear it here. Okay, so if we're in jam mode, we could say, okay, I want to have like in, I could come over here and I could have an introduction. So we could say, so once it goes through the introduction, we could now have it go to different patterns and we could say, okay, now we want to send a MIDI message and do a fill and it goes back to the pattern. So once again, we could just have this jam mode activated. So we can say, okay, now I'm in the verse. I want to do this pattern. So it's our chorus. And then you could return to hit one MIDI message and return back to where you were. Hit it, hit another MIDI message here. And you can say, now I just want to do the ending. So you could just kind of fire off different kind of preset um, configurations with jam mode to run that without having to be inside of Cubase. So let me know if that's helpful for you. But, and when we see that, that's gonna be in the full Groove Agent, not in SE. All right, so we see um, how to enter more than one CC, each one different from the next in the logical editor. Okay, so let's say I have just a blank instrument track. And let's come over here. I want to take, let's say modulation. And let's do main volume. I'll just make this low there. Or I'll just make it all, all high here. All right, so now we have, when we look at this, we can see that we have two different controllers. So. And we'll go to how to enter more than one CC, each one with a different value from the next in logical editor. So I'm not sure if you want to edit these or to enter those values in, but let's say, so we'll, we'll try both ways here. Okay, so we'll select this. All right, so let's say I want to uh, transform and I'm just gonna enter in one more CC value here. Let's say expression. Okay, so I have CC 1, 7, 11, pretty typical. All right, so let's say I want to take type is equal to controller and I want it to be controller equal to So 
So we'll say subtype is going to be equal to modulation and we'll choose our subtype here is equal to let's say volume All right so i want to take those and let's take the main value and subtract 20. all right so we're going to do so expression is here and I want to set my con my boolean condition for or. So now I can edit my CC1 and CC7 without affecting CC11. So we could do that. And let's say if we want to maybe insert those values. Um, there's a couple of ways to do it. One is if we go to the MIDI insert plugin, there's one called MIDI control. So we can say, I want MIDI, I want CC1 to be 100. I want to take my main volume. I want that to be 63. And let's say expression, I want this to be 108 All right so now when you play back this event or this track we'll have that i'm going to select that particular control here so i put these in so we have a lot of composers may start off this way because when they go to the track that these particular cc's are set and i'm going to select that and I think we go to MIDI to freeze MIDI modifiers. Let's see if I'll just come here. We'll make this the first event on the track. Let's see if that wrote them in. Let me just look at it in the list editor. No, it didn't write them in. So, but let me know if that's kind of what you want to do if you want to enter them in. But we may also be able to use, let me just check. Oh, if I turn it on, that might help. So now let me do freeze MIDI modifiers. See if no, nope, still not in. But you could probably also, if we go to the logical editor. see if I have a note in this if that makes a difference the freeze MIDI modifiers nope just a note event but if we want to come over here let's see if we choose to insert So I put in here, let's insert and we'll put our main value of 60.
So but you might be able to, I think you could do like multiple conditions in the logical editor, but I may have to work on that a little bit. All right. All right, so we see from Jack C, is there a sort function on the right side for VST instrument? I have a lot of plugins and they are all over the place. Okay, so when we want to come over, let's say if, when we see our instruments here, so let's say we go to media, we jump home and we go to our VST instruments. These will be just following the organization that we have set up. So we see drum, synth, uh, this is following our VST plugin manager. So when we go to our studio menu, we can see our VST plugin manager and we go to instruments. So if I say I want um, this instrument preset, you know, let's say I want Halion Sonic to be out. You know, what we could do is let's, we could duplicate this, I'm gonna come right over here. I think that we could click on new collection. So I'm gonna copy the current collection. Okay, and we'll call this Jack C. Okay, and in this, I want Howie and Sonic not to be in my synths folder, but to be here. Okay, so now once I've organized these and I can place these into folders and reorganize it here, that this order is now reflected here. So we'll come over, close all of them. We can see that my Howling and Sonic that I dragged out of the synth folder is now just hanging out right here all alone. So you could organize it in your VST plugin manager. So, you know, click on the plus sign to add a new collection. And then you could just say, I want to make a new empty collection. Come over, give it a name. We'll call it April 12th. And then say, okay, I like this instrument. I want that in here. And I want to add a folder. We'll call it drum. And then I want to take this folder and put it in to my drums. So now we could have a drum folder and all these organized kind of exactly as you would want. So that could be customized. So again, VST plugin manager. So give that a try. I'll just try it. Go back to my default. And you could also organize them by vendor or you could sort by co by category or by vendor as well. Great to see Matt Elston on. All right, my chat field just jumped. Okay, I think I'm okay where I was. All right, Jaxi asks, where is it indicated what scale is my grid in? When I zoom in, I don't know if I'm on eighth or quarter or half. Uh, can't see it indicated anywhere. Okay, so it could really depend on what your grid settings are. So let's say if we have this set to bar and as we zoom in, you know, we can see at the top here, like, you know, as we zoom in, like, you know, if we have something like this, it doesn't make any sense to see 16th note divisions. Uh, when we kind of, as we zoom in, we see further indications right now, we see quarter notes. Uh, we zoom in further. 
we can see that we now will see 16th notes we could see 30 second notes so kind of depending on your level of zoom and you could use kind of the top as a reference point right there so but and if we have something like loops we could just come over so if we wanted these to be nudged on the grid so let's say i drag this over like as we're doing editing we could enable like our link so we could see our nudge value here so if and depending upon you know, like what your master time format is we could if we wanted to nudge our values by holding down control and right arrow we could say we're linking it to the grid our grid is set to bar our grid is set to beat and our grid is set to our quantized value let's say eighth notes or our grid is set to adapt to zoom so as we do edits so if i'm looking at something like this now when i do it we're going to do one measure at a time if we zoom in further so it, you know so look at the grid resolution that you see at the top here and what these lines are doing and they can change depending on what level you're zoomed into as well so let me know if that's helpful All right, wonderful to see Gerald Ely. He says he made it in before they chained the doors. So that's good. You can see from Sway TV and Recording Studio, and probably on the absolute question, it says it makes total sense. Thanks. All right. Michael Teams has granted Gerald one gallon of Kahula Mocha ice cream. That sounds like a wonderful flavor. All right, we see Gerald Ely says he got a mean look from the principal. I'll have to get a note from Greg. So you're you're good at my end, as long as you hit the like button. All right. All right, so we see from Sway TV and Recording Studio, it says, please, is it possible to remove VST instruments from showing up in media? So, you know, let me know if you, you know, I know you asked this question a couple times, if that's not working for you, where we go to our studio menu, to the VST plugin manager, if I open up the right thing, and just hide. So let's say if I want to go to my VST effects and I think I have like a towel vocoder. So say I want to take this towel vocoder. So this shows up in my inserts. So I'll type this towel. Okay, so it's going to show up under other. So I'm going to now, I'll give it a try here. So let's find the towel vocoder. And I'm going to hide it. So I select it here, I hide. So now when I go to my inserts and we go to under other where the towel vocoder was, I don't see it. I go to type it in and the towel vocoder isn't showing up. So let me know if you again went to your studio menu to the VST plugin manager and have selected it and you can see that we can now select it and then unhide it but you can see that when you hide it it becomes kind of a bit more subdued in appearance indicating that it's there but just not visible now if it is coming up like if you're getting error messages <clears throat> when you're starting saying you know like this license is expired or this has happened <clears throat> can't find the iLock license that's outside of Cubase that's how iLock is interfacing with the plugin so 
if it's like kind of a scenario like that, then we can't do it. But within the program, we can choose to hide it. All right, wonderful to see Michael Pierce checking in from Grand Chapel Studios in England, just outside London. Thanks for always wonderful to have you on. Appreciate you making it. All right. We see from Art Rama, is that Cubase 14? No, just Cubase 13. Uh, DJ Mixes asks, um, do you know the VST tools, Spectrosonics Trillion, Total Bass Module, I can't write slash record, any automation data here, I've run problems, uh, I have no problems with any other VST plugins, so I haven't used it in years, I have it on my personal studio computer, but I haven't really used, utilized it in a project in a long time. So, but maybe if someone else, I don't have it on this computer, but uh, if you want to send me a note, <clears throat> uh, you, you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de, I'd be happy to take a look on my system and see if it's automating as expected. But if you could let me know also like which uh, operating system you're using if you're running Mac or PC. So I have it on, my, uh, on a Windows 10 machine. All right, so we have Art Rama says, I'm using UR22C. Is that okay? It's a wonderful interface. I'm using kind of a UR24, a, a UR24C. So it just has two more inputs. Um, yeah, they're, they're, you know, totally robust. They sound great. They have the built-in DSP. It's a great interface. And the thing will never die. You could probably run it, you know, have it run over by multiple trucks. And the thing is kind of typically... Yamaha over engineered indestructible and sounds great and just works every day. I carried an original UR22 on the road with me kind of pre COVID for like 10 years where, you know, I would do 120 flights a year pre COVID. So I was the guy that was always in the field traveling constantly and my URs have never let me down. So it's a great interface. Sounds great. Okay. See, Michael Pierce says he hasn't tried 13 yet, but it's all installed and ready to go. Finishing a couple of projects in 12 at the moment. Okay, and fiddling with his template. Yeah, so, and also if you're interested, you know, if you have Cubase 13 or if you have Cubase 12, there are, there is a 30% promotion currently going on. Take advantage of it. There's also going to be uh, I think you have like five or six partner products that even if you're just upgrading or updating to Cubase 13 or cross grading, or if you're an existing Cubase 13 user that you could get all those products free. So check your vouchers and your My Steinberg account. It's a good deal. Free plugins. All right, reading through topics here. All right. All right, so you see from Kevin Medbad says how to import and export your have Helix native. So I still don't have a plugin. We do have kind of a corporate kickoff in about a week and a half. So I might see some of the line six people there. So I will see if I can get a license for my studio computer, but I still don't have it. But you could probably check with uh, the line six people as well. All right, so let's go to some of the questions that were mailed in advance. Let me open up my Word document with those. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. And if you... 
uh, have learned something new, make sure you do hit the like button and subscribe to the channel and let your friends know about the live streams. It's wonderful to have so many loyal attendees. Okay, let me open up a project where I have some of the files prepared for this. All right, our first question was how to render multiple events and add space before and after the event so that it matches the grid. So let's say it's something like this where we have uh, like our snare drum on beats two and four. So let's say as we listen to it here. Okay, so if we want to, a lot of times when we render events, like if we select the events and do like a bounce selection command, it's going to be the exact length of the events, but it doesn't include like the space after going to, let's say, the next downbeat or the space before. So this is when we could use the range tool. So I'm going to just select the range tool for that area. And now when we do a, a bounce selection, the, it would include the entire range to match the musical grid. And, or another way, if you wanted to include different effects in instruments, we could have our range selection. Go to our edit menu to render in place. And we'll say, let's go to our render settings. And I'll just say, let's do this as one event. So as we do this, I'll just say render, and that will just render the particular event. I'll do it without it armed. So now we could render in place, and we're using the length based upon the range selection tool as opposed to the objects that are selected. So that's how we could do that. All right, so we had a question. Um, since there is no learn parameter for the mod wheel in Retrolog, how can I automate it? So let's go ahead and just open up Retrolog here. Let me just go to different preset here. Okay, so when we want to, uh, you know, so one of the things you do, you know, you can have just use your modulation wheel. So, you know, most keyboards, if they have any controls, will have a modulation wheel. So, but again, a lot of times the modulation wheel may be mapped to particular parameters. So, you know, we could say, uh, like our modulation may be mapped to cutoff or something like that. So you can just use your mod wheel on your keyboard. You don't have to learn anything for it. Or if, let's say if we wanted to automate the plugin, I'll just come over here. So let's say I'll play a chord. And let me just... So I'll record. And since I had to plug in record. I can just move that with my mouse and let's go ahead and play back, see if that's automated. Didn't automate so um, but yeah just use your mod wheel so let's say now if I want to record that chord so now that's recording the MIDI data and 
so that would be all you'd have to do for that so you know so generally if you have anything that's going to contr- that's going to transmit you know it's a knob you could just simply uh you know just use that and if you don't have let's say your modulation wheel you know you could let's say we'll select all the c all the ccs you could just draw it in as well and there's different drawing tools so if we say okay let's come here and i want this to be a sine wave and we could change the frequency so now as we do this so you could always draw it in as well so you know why it's not set up for learn is if any MIDI controller has one knob on it, it's going to be a modulation. So it's pretty common for that. All right, so I had a question. Um, how to save inserts preset in control room for Cubase 12 and Cubase 13? I mean, the insert setup of the control room. Um, so it says, it shared a screenshot. It says there's no explicit preset for only inserts in a control room. Inserts in a control room are also saved together with audio connection control room tab presets. Is that correct? So I let's go ahead and take a look. So let's say if we go to my control room here, uh, let's go to our inserts. So let's say I want to put a supervision and let's put a frequency EQ. Okay, so I have these two. I'll just say we'll put this on all right so we have this as our control room inserts so i'll save this as a preset and we'll see if it is actually going to recall those so let's go to my control room and we'll call this april 12th 2024 okay and I'm going to now remove those. Let's go to my audio connections. All right, and so let's go to April 12th, 2024. So I think that this might just, yeah, it looks like it is saved within the preset for that. Now, another way if you wanted to save these plugins one other method that you might be able to do is let's say if we have like a dummy audio track here okay kind of a cheap way of doing this if you knew if you wanted to save it as specifically a track preset so we look at like my frequency eq i have a little dip there i'm just going to go to the inserts and I could drag from the control room to a track. And then if we right click on a track, we can save effects chain preset. So we'll call this April 12, 2024. Hit OK. So I want to go to this track and let's load an effects chain preset. So we have these, and then if you needed to, you could drag them back in the same order. And we can see that our dip was recalled there, but it will be automatically stored within the preset. But you could save it as, you know, a control room track preset, but you'd have to manually copy these because we can't really um, have it. I, I didn't find it a way to put a effects chain preset on there so let me see if i come over here to and see if it drag and drops so let's go to user content to effects chain presets okay i'll remove these let's see if we drag and drop it from media bay i don't think it will oh yeah 
so you can drag and drop the so once you have it saved as a preset you can drag and drop the effects chain preset right into the insert slot there as well so a couple things to try All right, so we have a question. Hi, Greg. I use Nuendo 13 on Windows 10. Have you any idea why the solo defeat function does not work as expected? Let's say I switch a vocal track to solo defeat and then put a bass guitar track into solo mode. According to the manual and to a Q&A where you showed how this function works, I would expect to hear not only the bass, but also the vocal track. However, this does not work and I only hear the bass track. Is there perhaps a program preference that has to be adjusted? So I don't think so, but let's go ahead and take a look. I think um, just create it kind of a quick preset here. All right, so let's say we have, um, all right, so we have my drum loop here and let's say a bass part so this is our drum loop that we're hearing and I have the bass part so I'm going to unmute that and let me just put that to loop so now when I solo the bass part here my drums aren't unsoloing. So when I solo tracks, it's not affecting. So we can see that as I do that, it's still kind of behaving the same way. I'll take a look if there's any preferences. Like I think there might be like a deep track soloing but I don't think that I've set anything different. see if I am finding this one preference I think but yeah I mean it seems to let me know if that function isn't uh, working for you with that but I mean it seems to work as expected for me but I don't know of a preference I'll just take another quick look I think there's like a deep solo preference There's deep track folding. Um, and maybe maybe you have the enable solo unselected track turned on, but I'll try that as well. So let's say this is playing. So if I take this out of and that works. So it seems like it's working, but you know, let me also know if you have these in folders because the solo state of the folder you're using within folders may have an impact as well okay 
Question, um, is there a way to offload instrument tracks on another computer and host via network on another computer? So there's one way if you have it, if you have audio interfaces on both computers that have a digital connection, you could use tech technology that Steinberg developed called uh, VST System Link. So if we come over to um, your studio setup, you'll see uh, the VST system link and you could use a digital audio cable to connect both computers and they'll both be sample accurately synced and you could send 256 MIDI channels from your host computer that could be assigned directly into uh, like on a like a DSP farm there's also another really popular program that use that is Design for this use is uh, Vienna Ensemble Pro. So a lot of composers would, you know, have different machines as their playback templates, you know, kind of hosting all the VST instruments and send the MIDI from Cubase. So, and you know, it could be uh, a lot of people have kind of migrated to doing everything on a single system, but, you know, check out Vienna Ensemble Pro is a popular solution for that. I don't have a license to utilize but all right so we see question hello i'm having a problem and i hope you can help me please in a key editor when i'm trying to size the notes it's following the snap settings example if i set it to one one quarter when i will stretch the note it will move in uh, 128th one by one. This problem happens only to the right side. Thank you. Okay. So generally like the snap value isn't what's like, so if we go to our snap and we have this set to bar and let's say if we're extending the end, the length of this particular note that, you know, like if I was nudging the end of the note, you know, it's not necessarily the project level snap, but you could also be working with the quantized values. If your quantized value here is set to 128th notes, you could still be snapping within, you know, within the editor. And as we extend, it's going to be based upon the quantized value. So if I set this to 16th note, now it's only going to be snapping to intervals of 16th notes. So it's not necessarily the overall grid of the program, but what the quantized value is. So if I set this to 128th notes, it's only going to snap to 128th notes. If this is set to 16th notes, now it's only going to snap based on 16th notes. So it's really the quantized value and it could be depending uh, upon like, you know, as you, you know, so check to make sure your quantized value is set. And then I think that would allow you to snap freely. And if we turn off snap, we could place it anywhere we want. If snap is turned on by hitting the letter J at that point, we're only going to tie into particular lengths right there. So just check your quantized value and see if that's set to 128th notes. All right, so we see question. I have Retrolog 2.4 and Cubase 13. I don't have any factory presets in the arpeggiator phrase presets. Where should they be stored in Windows? Um, how can I add them? So. Technically, you can't erase them. Uh, it's kind of fixed. So I don't think there are files that are user accessible. So let's say if we want to jump over to our instrument here. So we'll open up. Let's get to my retro log. So when we come, you know, so make sure that when we do this one that, you know, we see that they're turned on. So a lot of times people go to look for presets So make sure it's turned on. And then you should see all the presets here. So let me just see which version of Retrolog 
I'm running if it's so you have a later version I do I'd need to update mine um, but you know so maybe if you just go to your Steinberg download manager from within the Cubase section and just reinstall Retrolog it's a very small installation that they would get restored but you know it's kind of set up where these can't be deleted by the user so maybe they're you know I think if you don't see those that there is a you know make sure that you're getting the presets right from there and not somewhere else uh, sometimes some of the parts can be a bit grayed out initially but if you start here you may have to turn it on before you could access presets so but you should be able to see those presets but I think if for some reason you're not I would just try to reinstall and I'll get the latest version and see if there's any change on my end All right, so I think that's the questions that we had mailed in. So let me jump back to our live questions. Thanks, everyone. Okay. All right, so we see Sable Winter says, thanks, Greg, this spectral air demo helped tremendously. So that's good. Yeah, and you know, get the trial version of the neck of uh, version ten as well. All right, so we see Bud uh, Maynard just says to DJ mixes. He just checked with Trillion uh, on Windows ten, and he was able to record automation. All right. All right, so we see uh, drums, drums, hi. It's been a while, common tone modulation and German augmented six and common tone diminished seventh. So let me know if, if what you want to do with those, if you want those chords to be notated or, or, or what you want to see with those chords. I'm trying to remember my French augmented six and German augmented six chords theory from college I knew that was the, everyone warned me when I was in music theory that's the one thing I would forget so former music majors all right all right so we see from Ace Amadeus great to see you on uh, hi Greg hope you're doing well uh, with Cubase 12 Pro can I use the Steinberg licensing system on my laptop when I go work on to my desktop, can I still use the USB licensor only? Thanks. So you could, you know, with Cubase 12, you know, isn't going to utilize the USB E licensor. So, but you could run your Cubase 12 license on up to three separate computers. So you could run on your desktop and your laptop. If you wanted to run version 11 on a USB E licensor, on your desktop you could still do that but you could you know just because you have cubase 12 that gives you the license to run it on three separate computers so so i don't think you'll have any problems all right so we see from dj mixes uh is it also possible to maximize retro log to the entire screen it's going to be kind of a fixed size so i don't think it is resizable but I think the design the comfortable the controls are comfortable and easy to see and kind of comprehend um, and it fits on most screen resolutions but it's it's not scalable currently So we see from Dean Garvey Jazz says, thanks again with Groove Agent Pattern on one audio track and Groove Agent Instruments hand clap on another audio track with Reverence Reverb. You can hear the audience clapping in time. I always feel sorry for drummers who, you know, they get the audience clapping and the audience could be, 
you know, so far away that it's off time and the drummer has to follow the audience instead of the audience following the drummer. So. All right, so I just see a comment. Um, it says, well, it would be a way to modify CCs randomly and maybe combine with Chance and Daisy Chain. Maybe Greg has time to get into it. Let me see if I could find that initial question. Or maybe a jazz dude could post the initial question again if I missed it. All right, we see Nick has made it back. Glad you're able to make it back in time. Okay, just reading through comments. Still reading through comments here. All right, so Sable Winters uh, just asks, Greg, please show me once more how you open spectral layers from within Cubase. I was doing it standalone. So really all you have to do is come over, select the file, and you'll see on the inspector the very top inspector pane you will see extensions so when we come over here if I do it on I still have a retro log track selected. Let me. All right, so select the track. I'm sorry, not the event, but the track. And then you'll see where it says no extensions. And this works via an ARA extension. So at this point, you could just say load spectral layers. And now when you double click, the sample editor uh, will turn into, sorry, just wigged out my system. But the sample editor will then launch into directly into spectral layers. So that's called an ARA2. I'll show it one more time here real quick. So select the track, no extensions, spectral layers, then double click. And we're instead of looking at the sample editor, now we're seeing the spectral layers editor there. So this way we could run it from within the Cubase project and we could just e expand it to full screen but still tied directly into Cubase. So once again, okay, just come select the track, go to your extensions, and you could also just see your extension right up here. So we select the track from the info line. All right.
All right, so we see Kevin just says, what day next week might you be able to get the Helix native free version so you can show me how to import export presets he made. <clears throat> I, I have Helix native on my system, but maybe if you want to reach out Tuesday morning uh, to me, Kevin, before the live stream, I could check it out on my system. I'd be happy to take a look at it for you. Okay, so we see um, maybe a clarification from Jazz Dude says uh, knows about how to manipulate some parameters inside Retrolog. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the modulation matrix in Retrolog here, real quick. So just add instrument track. All right, so let's say we have like a basic sound here. We'll just All right, let me check my audio connections here. All right, so now we could do, see if I remember how to do this, I always forget. Um, so we could say, okay, your mod wheel, and then you could just kind of choose, you know, okay, your source is gonna be your mod wheel. And, you know, we want this to be coming from a, you know, different controller. So if you want to come over here, we could choose different controllers. So let's say we want the mod wheel to, I think if we just click on, so let's say we want this to do pitch bend. But, or if we want this to do cutoff, and we could choose like how much of that. So let's say we're doing this in LFO one. So we can say, okay, let's adjust. So, and then you could just kind of set up different so I want my mod wheel here to do resonance as well. Or let's say, okay, we want this to, you know, do panning. So you could set up your, you know, multiple controllers to do different things in the modulation matrix. Okay, it's reading through comments. All right, Michael Teams wants to remember we Zoom on the last Cubase Hangout of the month, and this month should be Tuesday, April 30th. Looking forward to seeing everyone again. Michael Pierce is worried that he there is a hair challenge issued by Best Korean Jesus. So we'll see who has their their best hair game up. So we have about two weeks to get it dialed in a week and a half, two and a half weeks. Okay, so we see Sable has their extensions under control. All right, so I think we are out of questions. We'll see if there's any more questions that sneak in. I want to thank everyone for all the great questions that they've asked. Let's see, Sable Winter says, sorry, I missed the last Zoom, guys. Yeah, we missed having you there. You would have loved it. Uh, we had Chuck Ainley. 
just kind of share insights, wisdom, tips, and tricks for, you know, I think he spent about an hour and 45 minutes. Just, it was really wonderful hearing Chuck's insights. But we look forward to seeing Sable's gadgets since we missed them last month and for this month. All right, so we see set up by Marshall says these are simply fantastic streams. You're all lucky to be using Cubase. Thank you for the kind words. Let's see if there's any more questions. So once again, my um, I, I have to do something with my son tonight, so we may not see the index until tomorrow morning. Just a heads up with that. Let's see Michael Pierce just says thank you, Greg. Apologies for my tardiness. So no worries. See, Michael Teams wants Sable to bring new toys to the Zoom. So, probably Sable. So. All right. Now, Michael Pierce feels he has to buy something. All right, we'll see if there's any more questions. Sneak in. There's usually about a 20, 30 second delay from when I talk. See, Graham Witcher says, have a great weekend, everyone, and the wonderful Cubase family. Thanks, Greg. So you're welcome. All right. So it looks like maybe I'll give it another minute, see if any other questions. All right, Ben Loco asks, I'd like to find a way to get the control room back on the right zone. I think I deleted it while disabling it okay so if you don't have um so if the control room is disabled we'll take a look at it so let's come over here to your audio connections we'll disable the control room so now it's not going to be there now it could be another thing so if you right click make sure that the control room a is checked when you see cr if the CR isn't checked, you may just go between VST, media, and meter. So again, you could right click at the top and make sure that the control room is there. And if we go to your studio menu to audio connections, you'll see a little, you could select the control room tab and at this point, turn it on right there. And then it will become visible in the right hand zone. See, set by Marshall says he's a Reaper user. He just enjoys watching these. A lot of it's applicable in his DAW too. Well, thanks for watching us, and hopefully you'll give Cubase a try at some point. But thanks for being online. All right, Ed Rugman asks, uh, can you use multiple MIDI remotes at the same time? Yes. So. All you have to do, so I currently have uh, my Korg Nano control and I have the Choi Sauce controller. So if I wanted to, you know, come over here to a particular track, let's open up a plugin. So I could use both of these at the same time. So if I always wanted like these, like this track, the volume to be coming from this controller i could say let's go to my so i want to fix the volume here i could just apply the mapping and i want you know this i want fader 2 to do the panning so i'll come here and then apply so now i could do this and i could have my korg nano control set up to do quick controls for the track for other tracks as well so you could use both of them simultaneously if you wanted to so no problem there doing that so if we just want to go back and forth you could use them concurrently separately whatever you want so no problem
see Michael Teams just says, thanks, Greg, for everything. You are Yoda. So. Okay, so we see DJ Mixes uh, figured out with his trillion. Says, I found out there was out with right click you have to activate each parameter individually so it works so that's good all right bud maynard says thanks greg always appreciate the knowledge you share so david m says michael teams we have free access to yoda's brain twice a week so sounds painful <laughs> all right we'll see you see Sable Winters says Nanu Nanu. So I haven't heard a Mork and Mindy reference in a long time. You see Michael Team says, yes, we do. And it's amazing on the amount of info we receive. So it's the benefits of being a Steinberg customer. All right. So we'll see. We'll just see if there's any other questions coming in. Thanks for all the kind words. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me to read those. And I wish that everyone, I, I'm so appreciative of everyone taking part of your morning, evening, afternoon, uh, learning more about Steinberg products and look forward to doing this. Uh, we'll do it on Tuesday. The week after Tuesday, I'm going to be going to California. I leave Monday. I get back Thursday night. So that Tuesday, we probably won't have a live stream. I think it's the 23rd, but we will on that Friday and the following Tuesday, the 30th. So just a heads up with that, I'm going to be kind of in meetings for like our corporate kickoff at Yamaha Corporation of America. So, all right, so with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. I hope everyone's learned a new tip or trick. And if you have, make sure you hit the like button, tell your friends about it. Uh, and we will see everyone back on Tuesday. Thanks, everyone. Please stay safe and healthy and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much.